One of the missions I'm most excited about for 2021 is the commercial lunar payload services, um, which is with NASA, because what we're actually seeing is um, just with the exploration on Earth, governments going first and then private industry follows. So we're going to see private missions through NASA actually landing on the surface of the moon, so changing who can access the moon. It's no longer just about governments, but also private industry. But we're also going to see more and more countries looking at going to the moon. So Russia this year is returning to the moon. They haven't been for some decades. They're actually going to be landing um, a rover on the surface of the moon. And we're going to see also an Indian mission to the moon and just more excitement about the potential of what can be done on the moon, exactly. looking at resources that on the moon. That, that's, that's so interesting. It's, it's something I want to put to Professor Oja as well. Professor Oja, man hasn't set foot on the moon for half a century. Why the sudden or renewed interest in the moon? 50 years ago, when, when 24 humans went to the moon and 12 walked on its surface, that was primarily driven by geopolitical considerations. It was part of the Cold War, so it was the Soviet Union, the United States. And the irony is, although it was a politically driven program, the science yield was absolutely transformational because especially in the last three lunar landing missions, Apollo's uh, 15 to 17, with three days spent on the lunar surface, extensive geological training, it, it's fair to say that many of the mysteries surrounding the origin of the moon and the Earth moon system, uh, you know, we got crucial insights from, from that data trove. 50 years ago, specifically from those last three Apollo missions. Now, politics being politics, when, when the political impetus stops, um, it's fair to say that we changed our foci, both the Soviet Union and the United States. And of course, there was a bit of a hiatus, well, a bit of a hiatus, nearly 20 years. But then we started to get robotic missions in the 1990s and orbiting missions. And what we found is the moon is far more interesting than we thought it was. Whenever we make new discoveries, we have new mysteries that emerge. And one of the things about, about the Earth-Moon system is that the moon is like a geological time capsule of Earth's early history. Because, of course, on Earth, we've had active weathering for billions of years. On the moon, pick up a lunar rock, and the chances are it's been undisturbed. It's pristine. And so by understanding these ancient samples of lunar material, like the ones brought back by Chang'e 5 very recently by China, what we get is a better insight, not only into the moon, but the early history of the solar system, the early history of planet Earth. And if we want to understand Earth's potential future, comparative planetology, that means comparing Earth to other planets and their satellites is absolutely key. So from the science perspective, from geopolitical considerations perspective, this renaissance of a focus on the moon is exciting for all sorts of reasons. Indeed. Uh, Sarah Crudus, you heard Professor Oja there say the moon is far more interesting than we had originally thought. And that uh, immediately provokes my thought that uh, have we scratched, barely scratched the surface in terms of uh, resources and what the uh, possible uh, resources the moon could provide? One of the reasons we go into space, of course, is to, to benefit life on Earth and to extend humanity's presence. But there's also this very fundamental stuff that humans have wondered since the dawn of our existence, such as where do we come from? Why do we exist? What else is out there? And it's by studying the moon, which could have been dismissed as a, as a lump of rock only a matter of a century ago, that we actually learn more about ourselves and the history of um, Earth and, and where we potentially came from as a species. And then we also go to the moon because there's the potential, you know, to extend humanity beyond Earth. If we want to see human beings walk on the surface of Mars, and when I was growing up in the 90s, at least, I thought by 2020, we would see human beings on Mars. We've always been told it's the next few decades away. But if we really want to see that happen, we actually we need to go to the moon. That's what it's looking like. And we need to learn how to live away from Earth for long periods of time and extend what we're able to do and to, to live off the land. Because, you know, when people explored the Earth, they didn't take everything they needed with them. They lived off the land. And we need to be able to do the same on the moon. So the presence of water ice, for example, that can be used for oxygen. It can be used potentially even for rocket fuels. Yeah. So it enables us to potentially to use the moon as an, an intergalactic petrol station, so to speak, to enable us to actually go further into the solar system. So, so uh, very much a staging post, perhaps, to, to, to Mars. Uh, Professor Oja, um, is it true that the more we know about the moon, the more we will understand about the Earth? The presence of the moon has been effectively like a little bit of, of an anchor on the Earth's axial tilt. So the Earth's axial tilt is what gives us seasons. And, you know, astrodynamic modelling suggests that if we didn't have a moon, then we still have an axial tilt, but it might be a lot more variable 
than it is now. Therefore, we'd be a lot more prone to, to, to much more rapid climate change. I'm talking geological climate change over millions of years, not over the case of just a few decades. But that's just one example of how understanding the moon has given us new insights into the Earth itself. And as Sarah said, the discovery of, of, of volatiles on the moon, so materials that we can easily, they might be frozen, but we can easily get them in the liquid phase and then we can do our chemistry to get hydrogen and oxygen from them. The discovery of volatiles specifically around the south polar region of the moon means that, as Sarah says, we're not just going to go for three day landing missions like the last few Apollo missions, but we can get human presence on the moon from a science perspective for months at a time. And I'm confident that if we have this discussion in, let's say, 10 years time, Stephen, that we will have the equivalent of the International Space Station on the lunar surface. Well, we'll have astronauts, cosmonauts rotating for months at a time. And our science yield is going to be tremendous. And Sarah, what about international colonization uh, up there in space? And also Artemis One, which uh, Professor Oja mentioned, the first woman to set foot on the moon. That, that's all planned, isn't it? Well, I actually look forward to a day when we're no longer celebrating women's achievements, but it's actually women smashing barriers for humanity, and, and hopefully that will come through the next few decades. But in terms of um, colonisation, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, I think there's some, some great points there. There's that cliche line, and sometimes I'm guilty of using it, that the ISS um, is worthy in many ways of a, a Nobel Peace Prize because you've got those nations working together. But it'd be naive to say that people are going to get together, get on together as we continue to um, expand beyond Earth and, and further into the solar systems. But I, I want to go to Professor uh, Oja because I want to talk about the people you're teaching to be the next generation of, of space astronauts, space uh, engineers. Do you think it would be too soon to suggest they could be the first real generation of spacefarers. You know, astronautics is just one side of space science. Space science is astronomy looking out there. It's exploration going out there, but it's also the satellites looking back here at Earth, so satellite applications. And we're trying to train engineers uh, and scientists who work across that field, that swathe of space sciences, but much further than that, because even if our students don't go into space sciences, but if they go into anything to do with science or engineering or mathematics, then they are developing skill sets that are contributing to the foundations of our modern way of life. Because astronauts are so visible and as humans, we can relate to them. There's going to be that much more of a visible draw for students to realize you know, by, by, by developing my skill sets in science and engineering, there is a world of possibilities open to okay. me. Exactly. And as Mr. Spock would say, that's the, the logical explanation. I just want to finish with Sarah. Very briefly, Sarah, what's more important, the Moon or Mars now? Mars is hugely exciting because Mars and some other places in our solar system, those could be the places where we get that clinching piece of evidence to say, do you know what? Humanity isn't alone. There is life elsewhere in the solar system, potentially microbial life or life that exists in the past, which is independent of life on Earth. And that could answer some profound questions. But the reality is, the less sexy side is, I guess, that we it's more practical to return to the moon, this time stay for good, extend okay. humanity's um, presence beyond Earth, and then look to going to Mars. But the reality is, human beings are social creatures, and I think it's step by step, ferociously, um, that we have to take this, and, and the moon is that next step. Yes. But the ultimate goal is Mars, and to be able to one day look up at the night sky, see Mars as that red star-like object, and know that there's human beings there, that will be incredible, but I think we're still a few decades away, but I, I think we'll get there eventually. And then, of course, Mars is only just the beginning. You know, it will take many human lifetimes to even begin to explore much of the solar system. And that's what's so exciting because all of us are the space generation. We are living in the space age now and all of us can be a part of it. Sarah Crudus and Professor Oja, thank you both very much for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you.